This particular study we're calling Leading Like Jesus, and we're looking at Jesus as a leader. He is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. Yes, he is all of that, and we should emphasize that. But one of the areas where we fail many times is looking at him in the practical aspects of leadership. This particular lesson I'm calling the mind of Jesus, the mind of Jesus, learning to think like Jesus thought. I, I want to use Philippians, the second chapter, and verse 5 as our text, where he says, let this mind be in you, permit it, or allow this kind of thinking to become your kind of thinking. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And then it goes on and begins to talk about the mind of Christ, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. The mind of Christ, how do we think like Christ? Allowing this kind of thinking to become our kind of thinking. I, I, I would encourage you very strongly, this is why you need to read your Bible, meditate on Scripture. I, uh, for many, many years, I, I'm not able to do this now because of, of uh, vision problems and eye problems, but I cannot tell you how many times I've read my Bible through. That was one of the things I would do devotionally every year, again and again and again. I would read different versions and just because I wanted to get his thoughts in my mind. How thankful, how grateful I did that when I had the vision to do it. And by putting the thoughts of God, his word, in your mind, you begin to think like he thinks. It changes your, your thought patterns. So for too many Christians, we think like the world thinks. And, and the world controls our thoughts by the information that it feeds us from their worldview. We need to learn to think like Jesus thought. We need to think the thoughts of God. And if we will do that, it will change our whole Christian concept, our whole Christian life. Now, there are many, many different areas that we could focus upon in the thought patterns of Jesus. I, I went through this, and in my studies, I tried to pull out the three that I think are the most prominent or three that are most important, at least to me as a leader, uh, the, these three ways of thinking, and as I said, I'm, I'm not putting them above others. There are others of the thoughts of Christ that are just, I'm sure, just as valuable. But let me focus on three tonight that I think will help you. First of all, let's talk about humility, the mind of Christ. The emphasis in Philippians, the second chapter, is humility humility that even though he was god he limited himself the king james uses the word he emptied himself but it simply means he limited himself he put himself within these boundaries i'm not going to come and show you god as god is in the ultimate perfect sense i'm going to show you the god man he was truly god but he also was truly man. And it's a great mystery. But the emphasis here is on humility. He knew that he was God in the flesh, and, and, and the scripture I just quoted, he did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. That, the word robbery there simply means taking something that's not yours, stealing, robbing someone. No, it wasn't robbery. He knew that he had come from heaven. He knew he was the son of God, that God was his father. And, and for us to deny that fact, to deny that Jesus is God in flesh, is to deny the New Testament. Over and over and over again, you read this truth that Jesus is God in flesh. Let, let, let me just show you some verses here in the book of John that shows us so clearly. John 1 and 1. In the beginning was the Word. And he goes on and talks about everything that was made was made by him. There was nothing made that was not made by him. He was God, in other words. In John 1 and 14, he said, The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. 
tabernacled among us or lived temporarily among us. The word tabernacle there is like setting up a tent. And he came and he lived with us for these few years. So the word was made flesh. That's Jesus, the word that was from the beginning. In John, the eighth chapter in verse 58, that they were talking about Abraham being their father. These Jews, they were, you know, very religious about this. And, and he said, before Abraham was, I am. In fact, in the book of John, there are seven different times that he uses that phrase, I am. I am the bread of life. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. Before Abraham was, I am. They knew exactly what he was saying, and they were infuriated that he was making himself equal with God. One, one other verse in John, John 13 and 3, it says, Jesus knowing that he had come from God and that he was going to God, and then he says he took a towel and ties it around himself, and he began to serve them. The, all of these scriptures and many, many others show the mind of Christ. He knew who he was, but he had humbled himself. Now, it's well said, uh, uh, humility is not thinking badly of yourself. Some people think they're being humble because, you know, they say all these self-depreciating things about themselves. No, no, that, that, that's not humility. Humility is simply preferring others before yourself. That's what it's all about. It's not thinking about you, it's preferring others. That's the mind of Christ. See, humility is a servant's mentality. Jesus said this, I did not come to be served, I came to serve and to give my life a ransom for many. That is what humility is all about. So Jesus came to serve us, to serve you and I. And it's one of the reasons why we love him so. It's because he gave himself for us. That's the mind of a servant. See, the scripture that I gave you a moment ago in John, the 13th chapter in verse 3, where it says he knew he came from God, he knew he was getting ready to ascend back to God, he took a towel and he ties it around him. That is more than symbolic. He is teaching us a very important lesson. A towel, yes, a towel. A towel is a servant's garment. They, we want to think of him as the king, and he is. But the king humbled himself and washes our feet. It wasn't just those disciples that were gathered there in this upper room. No, he's done the same thing for you. He's done the same thing for me. He has served us again and again and again. He has served us. That was the mind of Christ, the mind of humility, that he come and bowed himself to serve us. What do you say when a king washes your feet? There's only one thing you can properly say, and that's throw yourself before him and say, I am your servant. I am here to do your will. And so the first thing that I see of the mind of Christ that I want to emphasize is humility, humility. And, and this is what we must understand in our day and time. The greater servant we become, the better minister we have become. I, 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 am, I am wary with the, the uh, rock star mentality of so many ministers I see, that they're wanting people to serve them. That's not like Jesus. You don't find Jesus doing that anywhere in the Scripture, waiting for them to come and serve him. No, he's continually offering himself to serve them. And I think that so many have developed a television celebrity mentality. That is not the way of Christ. He humbled himself. He did it willingly because of his love for us to serve us. So the first thing that I want to emphasize 
in the mind of Christ is humility. The second thing that I want to emphasize in the mind of Christ is the word kingdom. Kingdom. Now, it's interesting that Jesus only mentions the church three times. You find this, both of these references in the book of Matthew. Matthew, the 16th chapter, and verse 18. Upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And then in Luke the 18th chapter and verse 17, twice in that verse of scripture, Jesus refers to the church, and he's talking about a discipline problem there when he said, tell it to the church. And he's talking about, of course, church leadership, those that are in authority. If you can't work it out on your level, then take it to the leaders of the church. And in those Two verses, three times you find him referencing the church. Now, every one of us understand the church is important. It's very important because that's the house that Jesus is building. But in contrast, though Jesus only uses the word church three times, he refers to the kingdom. 127 times. He repeats it again and again and again. Now, it's obvious he's emphasizing something here. Kingdom, kingdom, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God. That w What he's emphasizing, he's showing us that the kingdom is greater than the church. The church is a part of the kingdom, but the kingdom is greater than the church. Jesus was a kingdom thinker. In fact, it's, it's some of the first words that he said when in Matthew, the fourth chapter, and verse 17, when Jesus came and he began teaching and preaching, and he said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In other words, you can reach out and touch it. It's here. It's come. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, note this. He never refers to my kingdom, even though... He is the leader of the kingdom. He doesn't talk about it as being his own kingdom. He always refers to it as the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. Now, I, I've heard teachers teach on this, and, and they try to distinguish the difference between kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven. I personally believe that is simply the writer's preference. For instance, Matthew used kingdom of heaven over and over again. Mark and Luke use kingdom of God, referring to the same stories, referring to the same parables. And they use the, these different terminologies. So I, I, I see them as they are the same. Kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God. He doesn't refer to my kingdom. No, he emphasizes kingdom of God. In other words, he didn't come to build his own kingdom. No. Remember the humility? There, there it is in play again. He's not emphasizing himself. He's emphasizing the kingdom of God. Now, what you and I must do, we must come to the understanding the kingdom is greater than the church. As I mentioned, the church is a part of the kingdom, but the kingdom is greater. The way I see the church, the church is like the local family. The local family, and it's in the family where we are brought to life and maturity. That's where we grow up. That's where life makes up its minds, and we, we, we become the mature people that we are. It's in the home. I see the local church is like that. Everyone should be a part of a local church. But when you talk about the church universal, in other words, the church around the globe, it's impossible for us to have relationship with every person, every believer, every Christian in every church around the world. You cannot have a personal relationship with them. That must come in the local church. But it's also important that we be a part of something that's bigger than ourselves. This is one of the problems that so many people have. They, you know, if you're the only pebble on your beach, it's a very small beach. Uh, that's not the way God intended for us to live. 
We are to be a part of his kingdom. And the kingdom is greater than my local church. It's greater than the country where I live. No, it's not a national thing. It is not a racial thing. It's not an economic thing. It's not a cultural thing. It's the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. And when we come to understand the kingdom, that's what it's all about. No wonder Jesus emphasized that. Now let me give you a couple of verses here that I think will bring this into focus. In the book of 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, verse 24, he says, Then comes the end. Now notice this. We're talking about not the beginning. We're not talking about what's happening through the end. Then comes the end when he, speaking of Jesus Christ, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father. Wow. That's why he came. He didn't come just to give his life for us so that we could be saved, so that we could be forgiven our sins. No, no. What was the end purpose? To restore the kingdom and present it to the Father. Now, in verse 28 of that same 1 Corinthians 15, he says, Now when all things are made subject to him, He's talking about Jesus Christ. Then the Son himself will also be subject to him, referring to his Father God, who put all things under him, Jesus Christ, that God may be all in all. Wow, what powerful words. That's what it's all about. That's what the redemption story is all about. He's restoring everything that had been lost, everything that had been destroyed. He's putting it back in order. And God the Father has given all power, all authority to Jesus Christ. He gave it to him. Why? Because he knows Jesus Christ is going to defeat every enemy. Every enemy is going to bow their knee. Things in heaven, things on earth, things beneath the earth. In heaven, earth, and hell, everything shall be subject to Jesus Christ. When that happens, what's Jesus going to do? He's going to turn around and present the kingdom back to the Father again. Everything has been restored. No wonder he is a kingdom thinker. We need to become think kingdom thinkers as well. Life is bigger than just you and your family. As one fellow describing his church, is, you know, me and my wife and my, our two children, we, you know, us four and no more. Oh, no, no, no. God is bigger than your four walls and 40 people. Don't try to put God in your box. Become a kingdom thinker. Wow. Let, let me give you a third one. A third one I think that, that's very important in the thinking of Jesus. He not only came in humility, he not only was a kingdom thinker, Jesus thought generationally. He was a generation thinker. We need to become generation thinkers. Uh, see, in, in many of his teachings, he, he refers to generations over and over again. Let me, let me just give you some references here. Matthew, the 11th chapter and verse 16, Jesus talks about this generation. Matthew, the 12th chapter, verse 39, he talks about an adulterous generation. Matthew, the 12th chapter and verse 45, he talks about a wicked generation. Now notice that. Every one of them, he's connecting the word generation to it. He's a generational thinker. And we need to let this mind be in us, which was also in Christ. Don't just think about yourself. No, what's the next generation? What's the next generation? Not just your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. Become a generational thinker. Let, let, let me give you some more references, and I'm just pulling these out of the book of Matthew. There's so many more in the Gospels. But in Matthew, the 16th chapter, in verse 4, Jesus talks about a wicked and adulterous generation. In Matthew 17, 17, he talks about a faithless and 
perverse generation. And then in Matthew, the 23rd chapter, in verse 36, and then in Matthew 24 and verse 34, he talks about this generation. So he's a generational thinker. Now, something that I need to emphasize here, even when Jesus talks about the resurrection, what does he call it? The regeneration. In Matthew 19 and verse 28, the regeneration. Now, what we need to do is let this mind be in us, which was in Christ. We need to become generational thinkers. If we're not careful, we make too many of our decisions just based upon today. What I like, what I want. The problem is today doesn't last very long. It's soon going to be over. It'll soon change. And whether you like it or not, tomorrow will arrive. It will come. You've got to learn to think of the next generation, not just yourself. Now, this is one of the things of wisdom. Wisdom comes through experience, and much of that experience takes time. And so at this stage in my life, it's one of the things the Bible talks about, the, the gray hair. If it's found in the way of righteousness, it's a thing of honor because it speaks of wisdom. Wisdom. I'm able at this stage of my life to look back and say, there's where we were 50 years ago. That's what was happening when I was a boy and a young man. Here is where we are today, so that means there's where we're going. And I'm able to prophesy or predict the future with accuracy because of the experience of wisdom. As leaders, we've always got to be looking ahead, thinking of the next generation. It's one of the most important questions you will answer in your life. Who is going to take my place? And I assure you, friend, someone will. Pastor, church leader, God help us to think generationally. Somebody's going to take our place. Are we preparing them? Are we equipping them for that? See, let's think of it like, like a relay race, and we're handing off the baton to the next generation. In a relay race... When do you pass the baton? Do, do you wait until the race is over and then, you know, I'm dying, so it drops out of your hand? No, if you wait that long, it's too late. It's too late. The race is already over. The new winner has already been pronounced. You've got a new leader. You were not a, process, a part of the process of transferring to the next generation. No, that's not the way it is done, friend. The way it's done in a relay race is you pass the baton when both runners, the previous generation and the new generation, are running at top speed. There's a certain designated area where the baton can be passed. If it's not passed within those bounds, then you're out of the race. You have committed a foul, you've lost the race. I've seen this happen again and again and again. God help us not to make that mistake. Become a generational thinker. That's what Jesus did. He's thinking not just of himself, but he, and what he must accomplish. There were certain things he had to do. But he's thinking about his disciples, what's going to happen to them. And so he begins preparing them for his departure, preparing them for the day when he's no longer going to be with them, preparing them when they're going to be running with the baton instead of him. That's a generational thinker. He trained and equipped his disciples for ministry. He prepared them for his departure. One of the last things that he was doing was building their faith. That, that, that's why he cursed the fig tree. That, that's why he, he spoke to it dry up from its roots because he was building faith in them to the last minutes that he had to spend with them. He's preparing them for the future. And finally, he empowers them with the power of the Holy Spirit. 
so that they were able to pick up the baton and finish what he had started. Do you understand that's where you and I are? We're in a relay race. We're in a race, and we've got to become generational thinkers. I do not know when Christ will return. I believe we are much nearer his return than when I was a boy. I certainly believe that. I, I believe there are many signs that point to his coming, but he's not here yet. So I must prepare the next generation and the next generation. And it's one of the things I'm trying to do, like right now. I don't want to take it to the grave with me. I don't want to drop the baton when I die. I want to pass it on to a younger generation. The psalmist said it like this. He said, we need to point them in the right direction. We need to empower them and then release them and let them go. How did he say it? It was Psalm 127 in verse 4 where he said, like arrows in the hands of a mighty warrior, so are children of one's youth. That should be our image. Our goal is pointing them in the right direction, empowering them to run the race, and then releasing them, blessing them, and say, run, boy, run. Run, girl, run. We've got to learn to become Thinkers like Jesus develop the mind of Christ, a mind of humility, kingdom-minded, and a mind that was always thinking of the next generation. If we do that, we're going to be effective in our lifestyle. We'll become good leaders. We'll accomplish that which we are called to accomplish. So may God continue to bless you in your Christian journey.